Welcome to Hustle and Flow with Heather Hubbard, episode 123. Hi, I'm Heather Hubbard, and I was a litigator partner and practice group leader at an AMLAW 200 firm. I know what it takes to rise to the top. I also know all too well the toll it can take on your personal life. So how do you shine bright without burning out? How do you embrace your ambition without selling your soul? You're listening to the Hustle and Flow podcast. Welcome back. I am your host, Heather Hubbard, and thank you so much for joining us. I hope you had a wonderful 4th of July holiday. I am super excited to introduce you to today's guest, Nora Riva Bergman. I first met Nora a few years ago, and so I'm going to share that story, but she is an attorney. She is a coach. She is a frequent speaker, and she is the author of several books. She is the author of 50 Lessons for Lawyers, Earn More, Stress Less, Be Awesome, and most recently, 50 Lessons for Women Lawyers from Women Lawyers, and I was honored to be able to write a chapter in that book. Nora, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Heather. I'm thrilled to be here. Well, I did want to share the story of how we met because I think it says a lot about you as a person. And so I want the listeners to hear this. And that is that a few years ago, we were both on the slate to speak. I believe it was at the Oklahoma Bar Association annual meeting. And it was one of the first presentations I was actually doing for a bar association. Nora is a pro. She speaks at a lot of bar associations. And she was the keynote speaker. She was the headliner. And Nora reached out to me. Notice I was not the keynote speaker. I was not the headliner. And yet Nora reached out to me and said, I would love to get to know you better. And we jumped on a Zoom call and we had a wonderful conversation. And as someone, I think we experience this in law or other areas, but it's always so nice for someone to reach out to say, I would just like to get to know you more, even when it's like the tables were turned. So I thought that was such a generous act. And I think it just says so much about you as a person. So thank you for doing that. And for then having me in your book, I just really appreciate women who help other women. And I think you definitely embody that. Well, thank you for those kind words. And yes, I'm only sorry we didn't get to actually meet each other in person in Oklahoma where our paths were kind of crossing in the night out there. Yes. And I just am so just absolutely love what you're doing and love the way that you are connecting with other women lawyers. This has become recently a real passion of mine, obviously with the second book, but it just seems like we are truly at an inflection point for women in the law. And there is so much that, that we can do and that we can offer not only to the profession and to the public, but to each other. And so it's just exciting to be a part of the women in the legal profession now to me. I agree. I'm so glad you shared that. Before we get to the book on the lessons of women lawyers, I do want to back up. I actually want to start from the beginning because a lot of lawyers, and I know you experience this with coaching, they're interested in different paths. And so you've taken a different path and people always wonder, how is that possible? How do you do it? So I would love to hear your story of how you went from a practicing attorney to moving into the coaching and speaking world. Okay. <laughs> how, how in depth would you like me to go, Heather? <laughs> Just enough to give some flavor to our listeners as to what that might look like. Okay, well, just as a little bit of background, I'm a second career lawyer, uh, and my first career was as a musician. I worked for about 10 years as a professional musician between, actually between high school and college. And then I decided, you know, I've done this for long enough. I'm, I'm ready to do something different. I went to undergraduate school as a journalism major. And as part of my journalism major, I took a class in First Amendment law and absolutely fell in love with the concept of First Amendment law. My professor in that particular course was an editorial writer for the St. Petersburg Times, here where I'm located in Tampa Bay, Florida. And I thought, well, you know what? I could be a lawyer. I could do that. That that would be fun. And so I decided to take the LSAT and apply for law school. And I only applied to one. I applied to Stetson University College of Law, which is 
practically in my backyard. And I thought, well, you know, if this is meant to be, it's meant to be, and I'll be accepted. And if it's not, then I will do something else. And I was accepted. (laughs) And my first six weeks of law school, I would say, were just, for me, incredibly difficult. I wanted to drop out every day. I didn't Mm. like it. And it was just so different from anything that I had done previously. But I thought, no, you know, I'm going to tough this out. I'm going to stick it out. Made it through those first six weeks graduated and went into an employment law practice. So when I practiced law, I was an employment lawyer on the plaintiff's side. This was shortly after, for those of you employment lawyers that might be on the line, uh, shortly after the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed in the early 90s, shortly after the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was amended to include compensatory damages for Mm -hmm. workplace discrimination. Uh, So it was a really, really hot area to be in. And um, I was fortunate enough to have some wonderful mentors who helped to develop me. And I met a dear friend who's still a dear friend, and we just started our own practice. And I enjoyed I enjoyed the thinking side of the law. Employment law is a fascinating area of law, I, just from its complexities and, and everything that it has contributed to our justice system over the last four or five decades. What I didn't enjoy was the litigation side. And that's a problem if you're <laughs> if you're a litigator, you know what I mean? Yeah. I could put that armor on every day, but and I could I was okay at it, you know, but I, I just really didn't enjoy it that much. And I recognized that about myself very, very early on in my practice. So within my first five years of practicing, I decided to start moving my practice more towards teaching. I got certified as a mediator and I started teaching alternative dispute resolution, both at uh, my former law school and at the University of South Florida. Again, had some wonderful mentors that helped me, helped open some doors for me in that area. And then I tell this story in my first book, 50 Lessons for Lawyers, so I'll briefly tell it here. While I was still practicing, I had what I refer to uh, as an ampersand in my life. It's one of those events that you mark your life by. There's the before and the after. Uh, And for me, that ampersand was an automobile accident that took the life of my mother and my Aunt Reva, for whom I am named. And that circumstance really forced me to realize that you know what, when we get up in the morning, there is no guarantee that when we go to work, we're coming home in the afternoon. So I should really be enjoying what I'm doing every single day. And when that happened, I made the decision to make a shift out of the practice of law. And as as serendipity would have it, I was offered a position to be the executive director of the local bar association, the St. Petersburg Bar Association here in Tampa Bay, Florida. And I jumped on that opportunity because I didn't want to leave the practice completely. I wanted to do something that would help me stay connected, you know, to the people that I knew, the lawyers that I already had relationships with and cared about. And I knew that my skill set was kind of focused on or that I really enjoyed helping other lawyers. So the executive director position was like the perfect fit. It was the perfect shift for me at that stage in my career. And then while I was the executive director there, I met the president of the company that I do coaching with Atticus and they recruited me in around 2005 to to make another shift to do uh, attorney coaching. And that's been, again, I was able to take the those aspects of my work as an executive director that I love the most, which is helping other lawyers in their practice, not necessarily the substantive side of things with CLE, but time management, work life, you know, integrating your life and your work together and taking care of yourself and being more effective, taking all of those aspects of my work as a bar exec and essentially making them all that I do as a coach with the lawyers that I work with. So I love that's that kind of the path. Yeah, because it shows that it's not always linear. And you don't have to know where it's going if you just keep taking the next right step right in front of you. Yeah, you're absolutely true. It's not linear. I don't think there is very much in life that's linear. I just had a conversation with someone before we we spoke today, Heather, about the fact that I read somewhere, and I don't know whether this is true or not, but it seems like it's probably true, that when an aircraft takes off from point A to point B, there is a linear flight path. But in reality, 
that airplane is making course corrections 99% of the time. It's going back and forth across that path. So we're constantly making course corrections in our own lives to get to the goals that we set for ourselves. And so much of life is, is knowing what that goal is, in my perspective, and being self-aware enough to know if that goal's still relevant to you, number one. If you still want to go to that destination, yes. and if you do, it's okay to go off course from time to time. Just notice when you're off course and get back on course if that's still your destination. So I love your 50 Lessons book. And, you know, we've, we've chatted before. We agree on probably most everything. <laughs> so for those of you that have not yet read this, you definitely, you're going to want to go buy both books and you can get them on Amazon. But with your 50 lessons for lawyers, you really do talk a lot about this concept of just embracing being happy and mindfulness. I'm just curious, how did that come about for you? I mean, I know I've shared on the podcast how it came about for me. I'm assuming you weren't just born that way, although maybe you were. How did you embrace those ideas and those concepts and start sharing them with attorneys? Well, so this goes back to the, my original shift from the practice of law to becoming a bar exec. So when the accident happened, when my ampersand happened, I was very close to my mom and my aunt. They lived about 10 minutes away from me. They would take care of my dog when I went to work in the morning and I'd pick her up on my way home in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. And when that happened, it was just, you know, I didn't even have the words for it now. Mm -hmm. And at that time in my life, I started listening to books on tape back, you know, a million years ago and you had a cassette player in your car. It wasn't an 8-track, mind you, but a cassette <laughs> player, not a CD or anything else. And I thought I need something to kind of help me get back to normal or recalibrate or get through this situation. And so I started listening to books on tape and that was kind of like the entree to me to shift being able to be aware of my thinking and, and have some control and I use air quotes over, you know, what the thoughts that are going on in my mind. One of the very first audiobooks I listened to, and by the way, when I say books on tape, all of these books were about self-improvement and positive thinking and mm -hmm. all of those things to kind of fill my brain with that stuff. Yeah. I found a book called Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway by a woman named Susan Jeffers. And that audiobook really kind of changed my life and my perspective on you know, how to get through very difficult times and to face the things that we're afraid of in life and know that we can get past them. I talk about her book in my book, 50 Lessons for Lawyers, and I recommend it to everybody. It just was eye-opening to me. I discovered people like Louise Hay. If you're not familiar with Louise Hay and her work, I, oh, she's amazing. Yes. Wayne Dyer and others. Yes. So that kind of got me on the path. And then sometime over the last decade, perhaps, I became aware of the concept of mindfulness. I'd always kind of noticed it. You know, I'd noticed books in the bookstore by John Kabat-Zinn and others, but I read a book probably about six or eight years ago called The Untethered Soul, another fabulous book that I highly recommend. And I actually listened to it as an audiobook. I'm an audiobook addict. That opened my eyes to really exploring mindfulness more. And then with the advent of smartphones and apps and things of that nature, I started to create my own practice in terms of making mindfulness and mindfulness training a habit. Uh, and I could go on about that. I, I know that's a passion of yours too, Heather, but it has literally changed my life in in so many ways and and when i talk to lawyers about it you know some lawyers are very left brain people very often and the, <laughs> the idea of it is just ah too very too squishy for them yeah. but the truth is when you talk about mindfulness aren't we really we're talking about training our minds we're talking about training our brains to be more effective and there's all these fabulous benefits to our health and well-being that come from mindfulness but as lawyers Mindfulness helps us be more effective in how we use our mind right. and to notice when perhaps we're not focused on that thing that we want to be focused on in the office and being aware of it and being able to change what our brains are focused on. And I think that's an incredibly powerful tool for lawyers. Absolutely. It's funny because, you know, there's the mindfulness concept of just, you know, being Zen. But of course, as attorneys, high achievers, yeah, I'm often like looking at the aspects of how can mindfulness help me 
be even better. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, I think attorneys can embrace that concept. And, and, and I will, I'll be honest, I'll tell you the truth. When I first started kind of experimenting with mindfulness, it was scary to me because I was like, you want me to be alone with the thoughts in my head for, for some period of time and not have a, the distraction of the radio or the TV or something. I got to listen to my own thoughts. Oh my God. And so again, I started with an audio book, another audio book that is absolutely fabulous. I think it's called meditations to change your brain. And it does explore not only doesn't give you just meditations, but it explains the science of how mindfulness can actually change the fabric or the structure, your neural pathways in your brain. And when I started learning more about that, I was like, this is fascinating. I have to do it. But I started with guided meditations so that I had somebody talking to me and telling me, here's what we want you to be focusing on. And then slowly expanding that, starting as little as five minutes a day or sometimes even less than five minutes a day. It's not like you have to sit down in the lotus position for half an hour to get benefit from mindfulness. No, a minute, two minutes, five minutes slowly, slowly, slowly making those changes can make such a difference in your life. Well, I have to say I was super excited when I got the 50 Lessons for Women Lawyers book and saw that there is a coming soon 50 Lessons for Mindful <laughs> Lawyers and 50 Lessons for Happy Lawyers. And I cannot wait. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, those are the, the next two in the pipeline. We're working on 50 Lessons for Mindful Lawyers right now. Yeah. It, it, thank you. Can't wait for that to come out. Let me ask you this. Because you've been coaching, at least officially, we'll say for, is it what, 14, 15 years, even though you were probably doing it before, have the, the issues that are showing up, right? Attorneys come you know, with different problems. Do they look mostly the same or, or has it been changing over time? Oh, that's a really great question. I would say yes and yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so many of the issues that challenged my clients 15 years ago, challenged them to this day, but in a different way. So often it's time management. And I say in the book, there's no such thing as time management. There's only self-management, how we manage ourselves around the time that we've got. And so when I first started working with lawyers, 2005, 2006, the huge challenge at that time was email, of course. That was really the big interrupter during the day for lawyers and help them create some strategies for dealing with email. So I would say email is still a big issue for a lot of lawyers trying to deal with that, you know, email dragon. But now there's so much more. Now there's pushes and social media and, you know, updates from CNN and ESPN and Instagram and Twitter and LinkedIn. We're just bombarded from all sides with interruptions and distractions during the day. So to me, to answer your question, things are the same and yet they've changed in a way. Mm -hmm. How about with women? Because you wrote this book for women, which was right. Is this the first time that you did something that was just for women? Yes. Yeah. So when you're working with women, has that really shifted at all? Or let me ask you this. Sorry, I'm, I'm changing the question on you. <laughs> okay. Um, do you feel like much progress is being made or are we still really stuck? Oh, I think progress is being made not as fast or as quickly as I would like to see it being made. You know, and when you look at statistics from, from big law, you know, women are leaving the profession in droves. Yeah. And I don't necessarily, I don't know how I feel about that, you know, because if it's the right decision for them to leave, mm-hmm. then they should find another path that makes them happy. Yeah. If they're leaving because the culture is so entrenched, and I think that's probably a lot of, of what's going on, mm-hmm. then I feel like I want to help to change that culture. And so much of the legal culture is not healthy. And I'm not, just not talking about women We're coming back to the whole time management, you know, concepts, you know, we, we live in a culture in law where, you know, people brag about how many hours they work and who came in on the weekend and who worked too late and who was in first in the morning. And, and while 
a lot of law firms give lip service to work-life balance, you know, it's with a wink and a nod because if you're not hitting your billable mark or if you're not coming in on the weekends or if you're not giving up family time, then, you know, you're going to have a problem. Right. So I kind of, I kind of was all over the place on the answer to your question, but for women, I think that, I think that progress is being made. And I think we're, like I said earlier, we're kind of in an inflection point. I think we're at a point now where we can make some leaps and bounds yes. uh, that just haven't happened previously. So I think we're in a very interesting time when women do have the opportunity to make some significant changes in the practice for the better. I agree. And so I'm curious, how did you decide to do the book, 50 Lessons for Women Lawyers from Women Lawyers? You know, it's one that just like popped into my head one day. (laughs) I can say when everything was happening around the Me Too movement early last year, a couple years ago, I never felt, and I think because I was oblivious to it, I never felt that I had directly faced like harassment or discrimination in my professional life. I'm sure it was there and I was oblivious to it. But with the advent of everything that was happening with Me Too, the idea of this book just kind of literally popped into my head one day, taking a walk, 50 lessons for women lawyers from women lawyers. I thought that's a, that, that's a neat project. So I reached out to an attorney here in Florida who's, who was the incoming president of the Florida Bar last year, Michelle Suskauer, who's been a longtime friend. She was a president of the Palm Beach County Bar while I was a bar exec, and we have just known each other for a while. And I, I emailed Michelle and I said, I have this idea for a book, and here's my idea for this book. Do you think this would be well-received? And by the way, would you contribute a lesson? And she, <laughs> she was really supportive, and she said, yeah, absolutely. And that was really all the encouragement that I needed. I'm like, okay, I'm going to do this. And honestly, Heather, I had not a clue what I was doing or where it was going to go or what I needed to do. So I enlisted a friend of mine who's an IP lawyer to kind of help me get things going. But it just popped into my head. I didn't know what was going to happen with it. I didn't know whether I was actually going to find 50 women who would be willing to contribute a lesson. And it just kind of took off on its its own path. It was one of those situations where I knew I wanted to have a book at the end, but I didn't really know what the ultimate destination would be. And I think we're still working towards that ultimate destination. All the contributors in the book, I think, have so much to share with women lawyers that, you know, my vision for this book, I think I've, I've said it before and I'll, I'll say it again here, is for it to be more than a book, for it really to be a community that can grow. So for your listeners, if they want to visit 50lessonsforwomenlawyers.com, there they can meet every single contributor. They can read an excerpt from every single lesson in the book. They can sign up to be part of the community. We don't know what's coming, but we're hoping that there will be more events like the the book launch that we did in New York in May, which was, we had about 200 people there for a CLE and a book launch and got some wonderful feedback from from the women who are in attendance uh, that they'd like to see more of these kind of programs. So hoping perhaps that, you know, those kind of programs are, are going to be happening in the future. I just really hope that this book becomes more than just a book, that it really can help to improve and change and empower women all over the country. Yeah. And I have to say, every single lesson, they're all so great. And, you know, some things you think it's kind of obvious, but we forget that one of the things that women struggle with is access to information because Mm -hmm. there aren't a lot at the top. And so you don't have the same access the way that men might if they're in these groups. And so just sharing these lessons and insights, I mean, I think it's just so valuable, especially for young attorneys. I would have loved to have had something like this, but I learned so much just reading it myself. So it doesn't really matter where you are on your career path. Yes. And some of the lessons are absolutely universal. They don't apply only to women. Most of them, I think, are are definitely written from a woman's perspective, but there are some that are that are relevant to both men and women. Absolutely. And I am a firm believer that the more men who want to hear from a woman's perspective, the better, because you may not even know that that's the kinds of issues that we deal with. They're oftentimes they're subtle, they're nuanced, and you have no idea. So I encourage all the women and the men to read the book. 
Well, I, I have to tell you uh, just a funny story on that. One of my contributors is a woman named Kate Kiras, and she wrote a really powerful lesson called The Pearl Necklace. And Kate is just a brilliant woman who is a board-certified employment lawyer who has changed career paths herself and uh, now is doing something very, very different. She was with us in New York as part of one of the panel discussions that we did. <laughs> and she said, our next book is going to be 50 Lessons for Men Lawyers from Women Lawyers. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and I think that got the biggest round of applause yes. oh in the gosh. afternoon. Yeah, that was pretty funny. 5,000 lessons. <laughs> I, love it. I love it. Well, so for those of you listening, I will give you a heads up. My lesson is lesson 24, and it's why saying yes means saying no, which was inspired by the most popular episode we actually have on this podcast, episode eight. So definitely check it out. And again, worth Thank you for including me. Outside of the books, how might attorneys work with you? I work with lawyers as a coach one-on-one, -on -one, the clients that I work with. You can find me easily by going to my website, which is Real Life Practice. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. And I think, I've said this before, I think this is still true. I think if you were to Google my name, Nora Reva Bergman, I am the only Nora Reva Bergman in the Google machine. So you can find me there. But the work that I do with my clients is one-on-one -on -one coaching that occurs primarily either via telephone call, via video chat. We use Zoom video rooms to connect with each other. Beyond the one-on-one -on -one coaching, I do a lot of speaking engagements. I do some work with law firms as a firm, work with everybody in the firm, but the majority of what I do is one-on-one -on -one with, with attorneys. And what kind of issues? So if someone's thinking, would Nora be right for me? What kind of issues might they come to you with? Yeah, you know, the whole concept of time management continues to be a huge challenge. I work with my clients around time management strategies and methodologies, marketing, client development, internet presence, maintaining, recruiting, developing the right people, the right staff people and attorneys for your firm, having an understanding. I, I'm, I'm not an accountant, but I find that many lawyers don't have a basic understanding of the financial aspects of the law firm, you know, the running the law firm as a business. So sometimes we'll spend some time on that. Yeah, there's a, another, I'm going to mention another book that I mentioned in the 50 Lessons book. It's called The E-Myth Revisited by a man named Michael Gerber. Have you by any chance read that? Yes. It's a wonderful book. And the, the one distinction that it makes that I think is so important for any lawyer to understand is that there's a difference between working in your practice, i.e. working on the substantive side of your law practice and working on your business. And so working on the business is all of those things that helps your law practice to be successful. And so I help lawyers work on their business, not so much in their practice. Yes, I love it. Thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you for writing the book. And I look forward to reading the books that are coming out. I'm just so excited to be a part of this project and can't wait for everyone to go out, buy the books, read the books, and check out Nora's website. Nora, thank you so much. Thank you, Heather. It's been an absolute delight talking with you. I am super excited to announce that the Life and Law Planner is officially here. It is more than just a calendar. It is a full planning system. If you want to take back your days, your weeks, your months, and your year, order your planner now. It will completely change your life and help you accomplish your biggest goals. There's only a limited quantity available. So go to lifeandlawplanner.com and order yours today.